Thank you to show sponsors U.S. Borax, Real Ag Radio, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep what you're looking for today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the agronomists. I really hope uh, that my feed catches or stays with me for just a few minutes while this latest thunderstorm rolls through. Um, I'm in the Ottawa Valley and there is a huge thunderstorm rolling through right now. So, sorry. Welcome here. Thank you for being here. Producer Jay may be taking over the show at some point. Okay. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to talk about controlling volunteers. And we've got some great guests that I'll bring in in a minute. But before I uh, bring them in, of course, just a reminder that if you uh, get those CEU credits, collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow. Let us know you caught the program and we'll get those lined up for you. Um, it is absolutely pouring and the lightning is crazy crazy right now. So I hope everyone is safe. And uh, yeah, I do hope wherever you are, if you have needed this rain that you get it. Uh, but as Peter Johnson has alluded to, there are some areas that have some edible beans already underwater because um, remember a couple weeks ago when everyone's like, oh, it's so dry in Ontario. Yeah, it is not so dry in Ontario and other yeah. places. Okay, let's talk volunteers, controlling volunteers, weed control with none other than Jason Vogt with Field to Field Agronomy out of Manitoba and Drew Thompson out of Southern Ontario with Adama Canada. Welcome here, Drew. Hello, Jason. Hey there, how's it uh, going? You know what? Um, I won't lie. I jumped a couple times during the countdown due to the thunder and the lightning. I, I don't mind storms, but I just, I'm a little on edge having to host a live stream during one in that I would like to stay and have this conversation with the two of you. Um, yeah, so uh, so yeah, so if I if you guys lose me, I'll come back. It's cool. Um, okay, let's start with a, a quick update on, as you know, it's raining here. Things look good. Drew, Southern Ontario, how are things looking as of today? Well, as you alluded to, uh, Peter Johnson said some areas are getting too much, and and unfortunately, where I am, we're uh, we're not getting all that we need. We probably only had about uh, maybe three or four mil over the past couple days. Um, and if you look at the radar, it's just this uh, almost looks like someone dipped a um, a paint or a toothbrush into paint and, and flicked it over to the map, and all these little tiny bubbles are. are going around and, and unfortunately they're all going around us so I think for the most part people are uh, really happy and getting a good drink but uh, some are getting too much and, and some are missing and, and not enough mm -hmm. so it's uh, one hand in the freezer one hand in the fire mm -hmm. on average just fine uh, <laughs> Jason what about you Manitoba's had uh, had an interesting year so far yeah we've been uh, getting a lot of heat and uh, not a lot of rain in a lot of areas so the bulk of our rains uh, since seeding, so the beginning of May, have come in thunderstorms. And so with that, of course, they're very sporadic, uh, very localized. We had a general system move through last week, uh, Thursday, that dropped four tenths to five, or four, yeah, four tenths to half an inch in a large area here in south central Manitoba. So that helped a little bit, but there's still a lot of areas that are working on not much more than that since seeding, actually. So we mm -hmm. were needing a uh, a lot more and then uh, what's happened with those that heat is we've had uh, a lot of spring cereal crops like uh, spring wheat and oats that uh, are yeah they're they're not looking good and some have mm -hmm. even been written off already so really? uh, whereas our canola corn soybeans actually right now are still holding on pretty good yeah um it this i don't know it feels like this must be a record to have write-offs due to drought before some of the deadlines really for some of us there did you guys just see that <laughs> yeah, okay, see the the flash. Yeah. yeah there you go just waiting for the thunder okay uh pete asked where exactly is drew drew you're south of hamilton is your area that you yes that you haldeman county after? yeah yep. haldeman county is where you are just outside of uh, um, on our in-laws dairy farm yeah okay um all right so let's talk uh Weed control, of course, we're, we're going to talk volunteers because, I mean, we deal with, you know, our absolute weeds, but volunteers are 
crops that we do want, they're crops that we do plant that have come up in the wrong season or are left over from the season before. So they present a bit of a different challenge because of course they're not strictly speaking a weed, they're just a plant. What do we say? A plant out of place. They're in the wrong spot, right? So Drew, in a year like this one, where it has potentially been very, very dry, are you seeing a significantly different shift in the weed spectrum in your corn and soybean fields with a return to moisture in some areas? Or how has that impacted the spectrum? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Every year seems to be uh, to be different. Everyone has that one field that has, you know, certain weeds and they come back every year and, and whatever the case may be. But um, we had that warm weather very early in April and, and that really seemed to, to kick things along. And, and so we saw weeds flushing a lot earlier than, than we have historically. Um, at our place, we went just shy of four weeks between showers. So anything that was soil applied basically sat. Uh, a lot of the weeds were able to, uh, to grow through that. You know, some instances of, uh, of reach back, but, uh, you know, not anywhere near as much as, as one would hope. So definitely there, there's some weedy fields. And, and I think that when we get to the, this conversation more about the volunteers, the thing about the volunteers, you know, I'm thinking a lot about volunteer corn. I think probably a little bit more about volunteer canola in the West. Um, boy, those, those seeds, they got a lot of reserves, right? We're growing them for all that energy that they have within and, and all that energy lets those things just pop up out of the ground gangbusters. And, and they seem to be able to flush where we, we wouldn't think they should be doing that, but uh, boy, they, uh, they sure can, you know, and, and it can happen over uh, four or five, even six weeks. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yep. I think we lost Lindsay there. Yep. We have her uh, just a snapshot of her face. <laughs> all right so i guess we're going to try and patch Lindsay back in here but uh jason do you have anything to answer to that yeah i would i would definitely agree with what drew was saying there too because um when it comes to the volunteer canola we, again something that can flush you know multiple times throughout the growing season as long as it has the moisture it has that uh that dormancy that secondary dormancy that allows it to do that um and we had a very similar situation here where we had Put a lot of pre-emerges down and didn't get the rains right away so we have those weed escapes uh, that we've had to try to deal with in crop and in some cases you know effectively and some maybe not so much because we've also then had the prolonged dr uh, dryness in some of those fields as well as the heat so last year the pre-emerges because we had rains almost every three days worked absolutely lights out and so this year they just not as much and again that was just back to the fact we didn't get the rains at the right time all right so we're just gonna have uh take a quick second here we're gonna try to patch Lindsay. and so i think what we'll do is we'll go to our first clip with rob miller and uh we'll try and patch Lindsay back in here number one rule is spray prior to doing that any tillage implement because uh, tillage you know especially the vertical tillage isn't really a means of weed control it just pisses weeds off <laughs> so we actually you know you can actually cover up some of the weeds you don't get the good herbicide activity it doesn't really uproot some of the weeds and actually uh, do a very good job at weed control so spray prior to doing any tillage implement and also you know consider doing at least three days waiting three days before doing that tillage just to allow the chemical to work mm. properly let's talk about uh, i guess some best management practices here. i'm looking around we've got a lot of dandelion hiding here under trash we've got yeah. a lot of flea bane hiding under trash you know uh i guess water volume is going to be a big point yes definitely so in this field uh, we have a lot of corn residue heavy corn residue we start to see some of the uh, the weeds emerging on that number one rule regardless of the chemistry that you're using whether it's kicksaw technology dicamba or 2,4-D higher water volumes coverage is key especially from on some of these larger weeds or if we are delayed by two three weeks uh, like i said earlier some of these weeds have actually doubled in size already mm -hmm. Get them when they're smaller, actively growing, and larger weeds, larger surface area, coverage is key. 20 gallons per acre. What about, um, I guess, a two-pass program here this year? I mean, you, you might get a chance to get in early, and mm -hmm. you may have to come back late. 
Yes, definitely. So uh, it's best to do uh, multi use multiple effective modes of action, uh, especially at planting, allow the, the beans to get off to the best start possible. So I'm going to do what we talked about in corn. And then also come back in using, uh, you know, maybe just cleaning it up using a soil apply residual herbicide up front and then doing that one pass in crop herbicide option to control any uh, future escapes as well. Mm. Hey, final point um, and a big point. Mm -hmm. I'm walking around here and yep. a lot of volunteer corn. I think we're probably going to see some issues with that this year. Mm -hmm. How do you tackle it? Yeah, definitely. So uh, with the challenges that we had in the corn crop with Dawn, we changed a lot of our combine settings last fall. We're going to have a lot more uh, volunteer corn this year. Uh, might even come in a little bit earlier depending on uh, you know what the, what the spring holds. Number one rule is we do see some antagonism with some of the group four herbicides such as dicamba with the with the group ones um, on that volunteer corn and on weed control in general. So let's control some of these winter annuals and perennial weeds now and split that application and come back in with the volunteer corn uh, option, uh, whether it's right after planting or um, or early post emerge as well in soybeans. So here's the fun part. Will I stay or will I not? So thanks, Ray. Thanks, Warren, for um, your support. It really means a lot. Uh, but thanks to producer Jay going to the clip there um, a little early. But hey, I'm back. I think the worst has rolled on. Um, but I'll have everyone know that I quickly threw a whole bunch of comments uh, or questions in the guest chat. So if it happens again, you two could just take her away. And also we've got some good ones. Although here's what happens when you get kicked off. I can't see the previous comments. So I do know there were some questions about volunteers, but because we did run the clip, Drew, I want to start on, let's start at the beginning of the season, which is actually the end of last season, right? So let's talk about how harvest conditions, which Rob alluded to in that clip, um, how harvest conditions, settings on the combines, those sorts of things can mean that we need to anticipate more volunteers the following year. Absolutely. You know, I don't know what the percentage would be, how many of those kernels that hit the ground, you know, talking corn uh, are, are going to end up germinating. But in some cases, it can be incredibly high, especially we had a relatively high winter. You know, when you wet and dry and wet and dry and wet and dry a bunch of seeds, they will start to rot and, and they break down and, and they're not going to be a problem. When you have a typically a, either a cold hard winter and everything stays frozen for a long time or you're relatively dry, you do get quite a bit of it. But man, you know, I don't think it matters what color the paint is on your combine. You're going to lose some cobs. You're going to lose some cobs and you're also going to lose some kernels. And, um, you know, you just have to watch the uh, the geese land in your field to know that there's, there's a lot there because they're feeding oftentimes flocks of hundreds, if not thousands of, uh, of birds. So absolutely it starts, but I, I, you know, I'm not sure that that one field will come off, you know, infinitely better or infinitely worse. There are examples, you know, one situation I've been talking to a fella is uh, they try to spring harvest, um, which is always a bit dicey, but you know, there's reasons yeah. for why that happens. Unfortunately, that, uh, that field also went through a, uh, an ice storm during the uh, the late winter and yeah. and so that really you know brought it down and i saw peter johnson's comment there about corn mostly comes all at once normally i would agree with a statement like that in in this particular mm -hmm. situation they're getting ready to to do the second application of a wow. uh, of a graminicide to try to take it out and you know you get called out because hey your product didn't work well you know you can very clearly show them the dead ones and then here's one popping up at uh, one to two leaf beside it and and so you know when you when you have those kind of numbers it uh, it, it really is crazy and and um, so yes the fall starts it but uh, i think every year we, we just have to be prepared for it and you know i'll let J jason speak to canola much more his wheelhouse but the joke in ontario is anyways once a canola grower always a canola grower <laughs> that is true uh, but J yeah, exactly. Um, for lots of reasons, which we can go into some of them. But Jason, there are, of course, still some corn acres in Manitoba as well. Um, mm -hmm. But canola, canola is one of those crops that regardless of how much we try to minimize harvest losses, it, it is prone to shatter. They're tiny little seeds. Um, yep. it, is, it is going to happen. So how, how do you sort of gauge harvest conditions for, you know, spring risk? Yeah, and again, that very much like what uh, Drew was saying too. If you look back to last fall, we we had good harvest conditions, but I think what we had is um, even prior to that, we had a storm event in mid July last year that uh, it really lodged a lot of canola, 
and actually lodged and broke down some corn too. So what you have is you got these mm -hmm. plants that, you know, cobs close to the ground or canola plants where when they go in to harvest them and a lot of canola is now straight cut uh, yeah. because it's mostly pod chatter, um, you're, you're not getting everything. So then that, of course, that event led to more losses that we had in the, in the fall. And then that subsequently leads to, you know, having these volunteers now that we're dealing with, uh, with this year. So a lot more canola and yeah, canola is this perfectly round shape, spherical shape. It can get everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. it's the venereal disease of agriculture. It's the gift that keeps on giving. So we just can't seem to get rid of it. And I know you love that one, right? You might I want really to have to do. Edit. Thank yeah. you. No, we're live, Jason. There's no such thing. Okay, um, there, we go. So there you go. Oh, but, yeah, there you go. Yeah. But it is that, you know, that perfect. Uh, and because it has that, uh, that we talked about before, that secondary dormancy, um, it can last for three, four plus years in the soil before uh, germinating once it gets close, brought up to the surface through tillage and things like that. And so that presents a lot of different weed control challenges for the following year. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a few different things that we have to take into consideration here. And that is, of course, that we're typically going to talk about canola, soybeans and corn, if only because, yes, they're often in rotation together for Manitoba and, and corn and soy in the east, uh, but also that we're dealing with herbicide tolerance within these. And so it does complicate uh, potentially the year after. Good question from Peter here. Uh, what about uh, people like Warren that do silly things like grow corn on corn? And I will just before I say Warren countered with, I think you mean profitable people like Warren who grow corn on corn. That is unacceptable, Warren. Um, anyway, but Drew, when we're a particular case for corn on corn, not that we are advocating such things, Warren, uh, but for those who do, does that pose a particular challenge or is that easily dealt with? It, it poses a, a, a massive challenge. Uh, you know, I'm reading the comments there as well. And, and, you know, in that case, the, the combine really pays. You really don't want to leave that field out to the, to the following spring. You know, as you mentioned, there are these herbicide tolerance platforms. Most of the genetics anymore have the, uh, the Roundup Ready trait. Um, you can then grow something that maybe has a, a Liberty Link trait as well. And so that if there are any volunteers, you can take it out. Um, but a lot of times people aren't necessarily thinking that far in the future. It's, uh, we'd like to hope that everyone does, but, but, you know, economics will dictate. And if the price of corn goes up and you've got a piece of ground that is very good at growing corn and, Hey, I can make a lot more money growing corn, but shoot the, the variety that I grew there last year, you know, was resistant to both glyphosate and, and uh, glufosinate. There, there's not a lot you can do. Coming down the line, there, there are more traits and, and you know, with the, uh, the enlist platform that, you know, is, is in the works and, and soon to be here. And I think maybe there are even a few uh, varieties commercially available. Those are also um, ones that will be tolerant to, uh, to certain group one herbicides. And so that gives you a, a, another option. But uh, for, for a lot of growers, boy, you drive up and down the, the, the county roads and you see some of those corn on corn fields. And um, yeah, there's some pretty green patches where obviously there was some lodge corn last year. And mm -hmm. with the exception of trying to do some good old fashioned inter-row cultivation, I'm, I'm not sure there's a lot of options. Mm -hmm. I knew we were going to have to talk about tillage. Jason, before I go to you, uh, producer Jay, uh, why don't we run our uh, first uh, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, or I guess our second, we had our one at the beginning. And then I want to talk about, because Drew brought it up, especially that economic threshold, we're going to dig into some of that on canola as well. So producer Jay, if you would. The Agronomist tonight are brought to you by Adama Canada, Real Egg Radio, and U.S. Borax. Understanding the interplay of macro and micronutrients is important when choosing fertilizer products and agricultural practices. The ag team at U.S. Borax are experts in boron's role in soil and plant health, including how boron deficiency can limit yields even when sufficient macronutrients are applied. Backed by decades of field research and lab studies, we can provide recommendations tailored for your specific soil situation. Go to borax.com radio for more. Sorry, I'm always dancing to the tunes. Um, okay, so I was actually, before I was rudely interrupted by Mother Nature um, and her acid reflux or whatever that just was, um, I really wanted to start with the discussion of economic thresholds and the economic impact of these things, but that's okay, we just roll with it. Um, but 
Jason, this is the sort of the second part. So we do think about, okay, so we've got volunteers. So as Drew mentioned, we've got, you know, green patches. We can think about hosts for things for, on the pest side. But of course, we're also talking about competition. And we're talking about competition for resources. And especially in a dry year, that's water, but also nutrients, all those sorts of things. So is volunteer canola, let's say in soybean, is it really just ugly or does it significantly rob yield? Yeah, it, it definitely does. So we, we think about canola and the type of uh, plant that it is. It can explore the soil quite well for nutrients and for, for water as well. And it's uh, once it gets established, it's a fairly competitive plant. It takes a lot of space too, spatially within a field as well. So, um, and what Rob Golden at the University of Manitoba had done was uh, re looking at research uh, back in 2014, 15, I think it was looking at that impact of uh, volunteer canola on, uh, on soybean yield, looking at it both in narrow row spacings as well as wide row 30 inch. And so they came up with some pr pretty clear evidence that said that, you know, under that nine plants per meter square in a, uh, I believe it was in a uh, narrow row situation in five and wide row was enough to cause, uh, you know, some yield, uh, yield penalty. And some reduction in the yield because of the competition from that volunteer canola. So it does, it's not just an eyesore, but it actually does cause a yield loss when you have enough plants per acre or per meter square of there. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So let's, let's talk on the, cause we'll explore more on that, but let's talk on the, the traits, because this I think is one of the things that is going to be more difficult to unpack. And as, as Drew said, you know, as we have other herbicide trait stacks or completely new offerings come out, it, it really does create a bit of a puzzle of, you know, what's our rotation, what's going to be next, what, what is going to be effective against some of these volunteers down the line. So Lavin, and I hope I'm saying that right, Lavin says, speaking of traits, how will 2,4-D tolerant soys challenge volunteer corn control um, in, in specifically for the DIMS versus the FOPs? Drew, I'll start with you. What do we think? Yeah, so we have those uh, slides that, that were sent in. I'm wondering if uh, if Jay could pull those up. Uh, I think that's going to be uh, really critical to uh, yeah. to talk to. Let them know which one you want. I'm not sure if we've got them titled. Yes. Uh, but Jay, if you can bring up the first one, we can go through them. Sure. So this is a great one to go. start with here. Yep. Uh, th this one really shows it. So this is based on some research out of the States. Uh, and what they were looking at here was they were trying to control um, volunteer corn and they were using Quisalifop. Quisalifop is, is one of the more common uh, herbicides with Adama, our product in the space is Leopard, but there's, you know, there's four or five others in, in the market. And as you can see, it is very effective. And that would be those bars on the left. So if you're applying it alone, if you're applying it in combination with glufosinate, if you're applying it in combination with glyphosate. So that's the black, blue, and uh, orangey red bar. And, you know, typically your 90% plus control, everything looks awesome. As soon as you introduce 2,4-D into the equation, and this is looking at both a, a low rate and a high rate of, uh, of quisalifop, you basically see that those same three mixtures, so either alone with 2,4-D, with glufosinate 2,4-D, glyphosate 2,4-D, the control goes to zero at the low rate. And maybe you see a nice little bump there of about 5%, but for a grower, that's the same as saying zero. And you look at that and you go, holy Hades, what's what's going on here? Right. This this is pretty uh, this is pretty confusing. Um, why is that happening? And, and I think this is one of these challenges that is going to happen as we bring these traits. These traits are awesome. They're going to bring a lot of agronomic advantages and, and whatnot. But there is some side baggage that isn't always promoted when you're trying to sell, you know, your, your best and brightest uh, trait platform. And unfortunately what happens with 2,4-D when it mixes with the Quisalifop or what we could also just say is the FOPs because there's other classes or other individual mm -hmm. herbicides under the FOP banner that would show exact same results as this. They just do not work when they're mixed with 2,4-D. And there's a couple different reasons why that is. Um, the FOP herbicides as a whole are not the fastest movers once they get into the plant. They don't go up and down the xylem and the phloem very quickly. 
for any of you that have ever sprayed uh, corn with 2,4-D, you'll see it gets that nice little twist. And even if you don't necessarily see that nice little twist above ground, that twist is happening inside the plant. So the xylem and the phloem have twisted. And so now you've got an active that doesn't move very well at the best of times. And the channel that it's trying to go up and down has now been constricted quite uh, severely. And so you're trying to get that AI from the leaf where it hit. To the growing point these are grass growing point disintegrators and you've now basically prevented it from uh, getting down there and the corn can metabolize it and that's always what's happening is there's a bit of a race between getting the active ingredient into the plant to the growing point and killing it before the plant is, is able to metabolize it with the 2,4-D in the equation it basically just says yep we're not going to let you get there fast enough be before it's done so you think about a situation like this, hey, I've got enlist soybeans. I can throw in some 2,4-D, awesome, pick up whatever weeds I'm chasing. I've got that pesky volunteer corn. I'm going to do what everyone wants to do, only one pass over the field, throw it all in. You're going to be really disappointed with your uh, with your volunteer corn control because of that, uh, that mix and the antagonism that comes from it. I had no idea about any of this. Jason, <laughs> did you know about this? Because I feel like, so this is really important stuff, right? Is yeah. that... With all of these, you know, with the technology that's exactly that coming down the line, we always think that a tank, a tank mix is always better, right? right? One is good, more is better. Yeah, What's and, going and on? We, had, we had that this year too, where we were putting down uh, Roundup and Extend Dicamba as a pre emerge on soybeans that were grown on corn round. And we had the volunteer corn, and the grower was like, oh man, I should have maybe thrown in uh, Quisinifop or a clethodim with that uh, mix of Roundup and Extend. And it's like, no, we just heard it in Rob's, uh, Robin Bird's uh, uh, video there that, yeah, you once you bring that in there, there's an antagonism you get from the dicamba uh, that reduces the control from that uh, the grass herbicide. And so same thing with what, uh, what Drew was saying. And what's going to be really interesting going forward too is when you get, start introducing then um, enlist corn into the mix, you can spray Quisinifop on enlist corn as a as another herbicide. So if you got enlist corn coming in your enlist soybeans, now that chemistry is out the window entirely. So yeah. there brings a lot of uh, challenges going forward as far as managing these uh, these her herbicide tolerant volunteers. So I'm wondering if, if Jay could jump to a slide uh, to, to yep. back. Which one? Uh, not that one. The next one. And, and so this this is some research that was done in the U.S. If you remember, they had that uh, Doroco, I think is how you pronounce it, uh, a couple of years back, and it just flattened everything. And, and 200 bushel corn, they were able to maybe scrape off 20. So they had volunteer corn just coming out the wazoo. And this is exactly what uh, what you were talking about there, Jason, is the red bar there is where you're either looking at a quizalifop or, or a clethodim, and you see that it is below what we would think is commercially acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, with dicamba, though, we can overcome that antagonism by increasing the rate. Uh, those are U.S. units. I'm not sure how well everyone can see that, but they're you know 0.02 pounds of active ingredient per acre. That would work out somewhere around you know 80 to uh, to 100 mils of the product, and then you slowly bump it up, and you can come back there and you know i recognize that as a fellow that plays in the chemical space that i'm just the used car salesman and try to get you to put on more but we can actually fix the dicamba antagonism through through higher rates with the fop products but we cannot do that yeah, with, with the uh, with the 24d no okay so what did we learn then from because this i'm having you know flashbacks to of course when all the herbicide tolerance trades okay sure there was you know, Liberty and hey, we could mention Clearfield if we really want to. Um, but you know, we've got we've got Roundup Ready canola, we've got Roundup Ready beans, we've got Roundup Ready corn. Did we learn any lessons from that? That now, as we're going to move into having enlist and having all these stacked traits, Jason, have we? What lessons have we gleaned from that that we're going to have to apply when we're bringing some of these other production systems into rotation? Yeah, the, the the lesson, and this is something maybe it's not as not as ideal situation in in southern Ontario, but we have such a wide crop diversity here in Manitoba. So the, the I think one of the key things is um, utilizing these other crops in our rotation to clean up some of these volunteers, like the canolas and even the soybeans, where we have some other uh, crop protection and group options. And uh, the other thing too is. Um, 
And this kind of coincides a lot with, uh, you know, battling herbicide resistant weeds, but the pre-emerges using a lot more pre-emerges in our, in our systems now, whether it be corn, canola, and even in soybeans. And uh, by doing that, we have the opportunity then to introduce other groups to help control those, those, uh, those volunteers as well. So it comes back to crop rotation and then it comes back to, you know, utilizing a pre-emerge. Drew, we have three crops in Ontario, apparently. We're allergic to any other than those three, I'm told. Um, and for some, it's really just corn and beans. Uh, Pete, cover your ears. People don't like to grow wheat all the time. Um, and so, oh, poor Pete. But does a, does a three crop rotation help um, to any any large degree, strictly speaking, when we're talking about trying to get control of these volunteers in, in off years? Yeah, so I think we can do it. Uh, I think it just, we, uh, the easy button that we all want to have on our, uh, on our desk or on the, you know, on the, the, the cab of the tractor gets a lot smaller. Um, you know, with what Jason's dealing with more so than we are in, in, in Ontario with the volunteer canola, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, we've got something that what we used to use doesn't work anymore. In the case of volunteer corn, it's like our tank mixes don't work. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so that changes things. And then we have to sort of think outside the box. Whereas I think with volunteer canola, it's just like, okay, we got, we got a resistant weed in the field now, corn, maybe mm -hmm. not so much, you know, and, and we can still do it. We just sort of have to make sure that, that we do it right. Do it through rate or being aware that, Hey, you know, I have, I'm going to spray two, four D I want to control my volunteer corn. I can't use a fop, but guess what? You can use a dim, the dim still work. Right. So, so we can definitely do that. But looking into the uh, into the crystal ball of the future, uh, this is not going to get better. Uh, more and more traits are, are going to come. They're going to become more and more stacked, and and it is definitely going to be uh, be a bigger challenge. Um, right now, we have um, winter canola starting in uh, in Ontario. It's not in a big way mm -hmm. yet, but the guys that have been doing it have really started to figure out the agronomics to, to make it successful. Um, it is bringing in that fourth crop. It is bringing in a another broadleaf crop, and and doing very very well for them. And right now, that is not traited canola, but it mm -hmm. may soon be right, right. If, if those acres yeah. grow and everything else like that so we always hope that that you know we can watch and, and learn from others and, and you know we'll watch and learn from the, our friends in the west and say okay those guys figured out how to how to control it and and we'll we'll ride their their best practices but um unfortunately it always can take a year or two of uh you know we're not allowed to swear we're live but right. shoot except with the, without the o and uh you know how do we um how do we make this better, right? And and and, and we will learn, and, and we do a pretty good job. But no, I don't think we have a challenge there with the three crops. I don't think that's going to to limit us. And I will give a shout out. Um, wheat really allows you to get some, some new chemistries and, and some new options and some new timing in. So it's a great crop if you've got some challenging weeds, be they volunteers or otherwise. Yep. Peter says winter canola is so aggressive it hardly needs weed control. Oh, that's Peter. the problem though. So when it becomes a weed. <laughs> Now you have a yes. Super weed, right? <laughs> okay, but in fairness, in fairness, we we are learning. I think, and to this point, we are learning about how best to use a fall seeded aggressive crop in these systems of our spring planted crops, different crop types, a broadleaf and a cereal. If right, it's a puzzle. So we're putting together these puzzle pieces, and by adding that layer of different time of year. Uh, maybe very aggressive, um, we can potentially really get ahead of some of these problems. Like I'm also thinking about, you know, rye after um, rye in the fall, trying to get rid of fleabane with our soybeans and these are like, there are different things that we can be playing with um, for sure, for sure. So that is now, but Jason, we don't grow winter canola out West. Let's, let's just make that very clear. It has been tried. Um, all sorts of things have been tried. It just don't work. It is spring, but it's that, but spring canola is also quite aggressive once it gets going, which is why it is such an issue in mm -hmm. soybeans for sure. So what, um, yeah. what is there a magic formula for getting canola out of beans? Cause we know it is, you know, obviously expensive if we leave it there. So yeah. is there a magic formula? Yeah. So outside of what we talked about with utilizing these other crops in rotation, um, one of the things I should have mentioned before, is uh, looking at some of these cultural controls that we can do too. So 
um, moving a lot more of our growers to narrower row soybeans instead of wide row. So you get that canopy closure a lot earlier to compete with that canola is going to be one thing. And then incorporating that with uh, along with those pre-emerges. So there's no one silver bullet, but there's, you know, there's multiple layers to, to do this. So, you know, looking at narrower rows, putting on a pre-emerge. Um, and in some cases, I had a grower this year who grows seed production soybeans. And we know that dicamba isn't the best on volunteer canola. Um, better if you can apply it as a pre-emerge. Um, but what we did too is we actually, uh, this is an expensive option and wouldn't happen all the time, but he put down a, a dicamba as a pre along with a Viraxer, so, uh, so a product from, from BASF, and which has a bit better control on canola. And that cleaned everything right up. And we've had basically no uh, flushing canola coming up in that system. But that's not to say that that you know, can't happen. But if we do have these other options uh, or other situations where we have canola coming in crop, um, as you saw by that uh, the document I sent you from Rob Golden, there was multiple uh, products that they were used in, in crop. So like Odyssey, Solo, Reflex, yeah. Bazigran. So Here, I don't know if you want pull, to. Yeah, let's pull some of those yeah. up. Jay, I think it's slide 40 is where our, our post-merge herbicides are. And we've got some decent uh comparisons of what some of these are so this is just to jason's point uh rob golden at the u of m um and i think jeanette gautier worked on this project yeah she did as when well she back with, uh, uh, weed, weed specialist at that time yeah yeah and so, so you, you can you yeah. can see the uh the different in crop options they're looking at um um you know for example the odyssey in the top left you know and then uh thyphens sulfuron looking at you know it didn't really do enough on the canola and again, too, what it comes back to is what what herbicide tolerance system of canola do you have in your fields? Yeah. We primarily grow a glufosinate tolerant, Liberty tolerant, but even every bag of Liberty, every Invigor seed or whatever it is, has some impurities in it. And so there's always going to be some potential Roundup Ready seed in there. And if you've got a history of even having some clear fuel canola uh, that might volunteer then those options like the Odyssey and the Solo are not even going to work. So then you have to look at something else. So if you go maybe to the next slide. I was just going to say, though, top right, that's an intercrop, Jason. That's what that yes. is. Yes, that, that's yeah. what it looks like. That's, yeah, that, that's what it was. Yeah. Sure. Okay. It's an Let's unintentional that. one, but yes, that's that. what that is. Yeah. So then if you have those kind of potential uh, problems with multiple different herbicide-tolerant canolas coming in, that's when you're going to have to start looking at something like uh, the top le uh, right and, and bottom right of uh, Vazagran and Reflex. And you can see the Vazagran doesn't really do a whole lot, especially when the canola gets quite large. Reflex is a little bit better. Um, but the problem with that is you also start have, have to start looking at your recropping restrictions. And then uh, and that's a big issue with this as well. So there's it's, it's there's no silver bullet. That's for sure. And so all these kind of things have to be looked at uh, individually, case by case, and managed that way, farm by farm. Drew, you, yeah, you, you're agreeing on the recropping. It's not a term I hear a ton of in Ontario. I think, what, do we worry about edible beans for the most part? What is our, our crop that we're most worried about in Ontario when we're talking recropping restrictions? Well, it would be beans, but it, it could be soybeans as well. And, and you know, I think yeah. we sometimes forget that there is new Liskard area uh, and, and you yes. know, had the opportunity to uh, to get up there and, and meet some of the growers and, and some of the retails up there. And, and they, they worry about the recrop in a massive way. Um, mm -hmm. You think about something like reflex in, um, in dry beans, you know, if it gets applied late, you know, middle of July, and then the weather turns quite dry and hot afterwards, you know, you can have that carry over. I have seen it hurt corn in, in the corners, you know, even though we have all these fancy sprayers anymore, it does go on a little bit thicker when the, the booms turn into the inside and, you know, typically not serious, but you know, it definitely is, is something you can pick up afterwards. So it is very much an issue. And, and Jason, I'd be interested in your comments, but again, to the, the more northern regions of our uh, of our soybean production area in Ontario, you know, we're down into the double zeros. There's a couple triple zero varieties that are around and they have been using some of those post chemistries and have actually found that that I always refer to it as the metabolic penalty, but it actually mm. delayed maturity enough 
you know, four, five, six days if it was applied at the wrong time, plant was under stress. And, and all of a sudden you're trying to take your beans off and mother nature decides to throw a little bit of the white stuff at you. And, and that has been a concern, you know, uh, and not trying to pick on any one else's chemicals or whatnot, but there was a couple that were quite commonly used. And, and now they're so, and I'm not sure we can do that anymore because it, it is adding that, that much, you know, typically five to seven days maturity. Yeah. So they either have to drop down a maturity range or, or they have to figure something else out. Exactly. And that is very true. And I mean, uh, I'm assuming by these rates that Rob was golding, these were, you know, full recommended rates typically. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the past, we've, we've used, uh, you know, lower rates to just kind of maybe manage some of the canola, which would then help a little bit with the crop tolerance. But that is a big issue, a big, a big risk for sure, you know, that you could have that. And one in particular is like the Pinnacles, those type of products that are registered. Um, they're really hard on our, on our soybeans. And so that is something that we've seen in the past. They can do a pretty good job of cleaning up the canola as well as some other broadleaf weeds. But there is definitely, uh, um, like you said, under under a stress already, that's going to hurt that, those uh, soybeans and delay their maturity. When So when we're talking under stress, how do you make that call? Like obviously, like a drought stress is pretty apparent. You know, it's been hot, dry. Okay, cool. But like, where's that line? I don't feel like you can like, Hey, soybeans, how are you feeling today? How stressed are you, right? I mean, we have to know what is too stressed to maybe, maybe you've got to choose a different product or maybe you've just got to recognize you're going to be going in later. Like, how do you make, because to me, it's all about that risk reward decision. So how do you decide that crop is under too much stress? I'm not going to use this product. I'm not going to go in. Is there sort of a, a line, whether it's, you know, is it insect pressure? Is it hot and dry? What is it? it's it's probably that's the artistry of of agronomy and and you know we do like to to rely on the science but uh when you walk a field that's under stress you know you know it's sometimes hard to to point this out or that out but you know the leaves aren't as big the color's not as vibrant you you dig up some roots and you realize that they hit a hard pan and and rather than going down they went sideways um it, it is normally drought related stress probably nine times out of ten is 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 the biggest stress you can go into situations though where it's fertility and and you know you can start to pick up the uh the early signs of of some nutrient deficiency but that's the artistry right is is learning how to learn the language of the crop and if you if you study it enough and you look at it enough the the crop will tell you what is right or what is wrong and and when there's too much that's wrong you sort of say hey we we can't throw any more at this We, we have to come up with a with a different strategy or wait for a rain and hopefully you know, let things uh, improve. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm going to pause there for just a moment. We've got one last thank you to our show sponsors for tonight. And then I've got uh, a few more questions for our panel. Tonight's show is brought to you by Adama Canada, US Borax and Real Ag Radio. Real Ag Radio runs Monday to Friday at 4.30 Eastern on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM or anytime on Spotify. Check out realagriculture.com slash radio for the latest and all past episodes. Quick shout out to myself. I'm hosting Real Ag Radio tomorrow. All right. Okay. Uh, Check it out. It's a lot of fun. I really like it. Okay. So we've got some, we've got some questions here. We've got about 15 minutes left. So uh, I will encourage everyone if you're watching if you've got questions uh please throw them in there because we always love them but we do so peter johnson's mentioned a couple others as well we've talked about sort of the economic impact but we do have to talk about potentially um quality impacts on edible beans for sure um Mm. drew how important is it to get a hold of some of these volunteers because of the quality aspect to edibles oh it's it's huge they do not want to see any corn in there at all so so that's number one right and and not every volunteer plant does produce an ear but most of them will and and so to me that's a big one um right now the edible space is predominantly uh harvested uh the harvest aid and and typically that harvest aid you know if it is being direct combined that would be something like like an aragon which basically does diddly squat to uh, to corn and and unfortunately you now have this big green juicy thing that you're putting through the combine Mm -hmm. with you and and you are soaking those beans and they're getting dirt tagged they're getting mud tagged and and they come out looking like uh, robins or they just look ugly and and um 
you know, so that's a huge one as, as well as the, the contamination issue. And that would be dry beans, but that would also uh, fall into the, uh, the IP space as well. Yeah. Yeah, Jason, um, I, that's a great visual, Drew. Thank you for that. Um, the just look ugly and the green juicy thing. Also, I'll just note Aragon in the West is called Heat. Same thing, different name. Um, but uh, just in case yeah. someone was watching for the West, that's what you need to know. Uh, so, Jason, of course, Manitoba grows a lot of dry beans, a lot of edible beans. Um, what's the concern there? Do we have concerns, obviously, with corn, but any other crops as well? Yeah, really. I saw Peter's uh, question there about volunteer canola being an issue with dry beans. And honestly, it's not that bad because we do have those chemistries that we've talked about. Um, Pursuit hasn't been used a lot anymore, but laying it down as a pre-emerge, um, even with something like a permit, um, and then coming back in with a Bazagran reflex, you got pretty good options there to help really stay on top of the canola. So it seems to be the issue, uh, pretty good there. And then the, the, as was mentioned too, uh, the volunteer corn, not as much. We don't really have a lot of guys doing dry beans on corn as much as there used to be. And so, uh, but when it is there, I mean, we have those grass options to control it. Probably one of the other things that we've had issues with in the past is guys that grow a lot of seed production soybeans here that I work with. And the uh, corn is uh, zero tolerance there as well. So that's where we also have to really help manage uh, keeping it clean there too. But uh, when it comes back to the dry beans, no, not really. It's not so much the volunteers. It's more other weeds um, like the like the nightshades and the, and the pigweeds that are a bigger issue. Oh, pigweed. Um, a pigweed's an issue for everybody. It's just a jerk. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, Lavin's got a question here. There are a few group two post-emerge products for IP soybeans. Uh are they mostly the same for recrop or crop sensitivity? Good question. I have no idea. Drew, do you have any ideas? Because I have zero. Yeah, no, it's 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 a great question. And it's one of those things that when we look at it, you know, there's always a PHI. There, there's always, you know, that fun stuff that, that's on it. And, you, you know, in Ontario anyways, we've got our big book of uh, weed control, Pub, Pub 75. And it will tell you so many months after application before you can mm -hmm. plant different crops. So if I'm using that active as a soil applied chemistry and and then i'm also going to use it on another field post emergent i could be applying it as early as, as the first week of may and then post emergent i could be applying it as as late as the first week of july and those two months those are the most crucial months in my opinion because they're hot they're typically they've got ample moisture and so the microbes that do most of the breakdown are just chewing through those in a big way mm -hmm. and and i can't necessarily think of an example off the top of my head of, of a field i've been into in, in a soybean situation but definitely in a corn situation where you know a certain active was applied late and the following year all the fellow soybeans went white and and so that is not good and that same grower had used that chemistry previously but he had used it soil applied and so that you know right. five six week difference made it made it you know obviously the year factored in as well but absolutely you have to be careful did i use it pre or did i use it post yeah. because there's a big window there that, that can cause a lot of grief the following spring mm -hmm. right because we need those so and it's driven by temperature and moisture right because that's what drives the microbial breakdown of these products so and this is why jason I, I mean, out west, certainly in Saskatchewan, especially with, you know, pulses in rotation, always a concern as to, you know, recropping restrictions. But with such dry conditions that Manitoba has had over the past uh, two years, although sort of swinging one way to the other on some. But have you have you been somewhat surprised by some residual showing up where you didn't expect it? Yeah, definitely. Um when it comes to the like the IP soybeans or the other pulses that we've grown, like the uh, peas and the products that we've been using in them, not seeing as much there as I thought I would. But where we have seen it certainly has been the reflex, um, the using that active and applying it maybe too late in season and having issues with canola the next year, uh, sunflowers. But what really caught us by a little bit by surprise two years ago was uh, one of the more popular uh corn mixes here is uh, glyphosate with uh, Armazon, so tropamizone, group 27, and uh, with atrazine, and sometimes with, sometimes without. 
And we had a lot of uh, atrazine and, but also a lot of uh, Armazon uh, recrop or uh, carryover that affected the soybeans the year following the corn. So we, when we had that going from 2020 into 21, so that was actually something that was a bit of a surprise. And I've actually even seen it this year on headlands, even after a wet year like last year. So just kind of really? gives you the, and a lot of that comes back to the soil texture. This is very sandy soils, very low organic matter. Um, but it just brings to mind that even though when you look at a lot of the literature, it's not supposed to have a recropping issue, but yeah. in certain situations it can. Soils don't microbes. Recropping. I was just going to say the microbes <laughs> yeah. don't read. They, uh, they don't. Yeah. They well, are they illiterate fools. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't care. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, it's true. And so, as Peter said earlier, the, the art of applying the science, right? That's where so much of this comes through. Um, recognizing soil, soil types, uh, role in this moisture of course temperature uh the time all of those things so you know it's certainly when we think about things like carryover we often you know winter doesn't count either right for the west because it's frozen it's not that doesn't count in ontario a mm -hmm. little different story depending on where you mm -hmm. are but in the west for the most part we don't count our winter um so yeah so it does definitely you have to think about what's happening uh, in season. And uh, Peter adds, pH can play in breakdown as well. Absolutely. Let's have a little chemistry lesson, shall we? All right. So very quickly, because we are we are running, uh, running low on time here. Um, so Drew, I want to, as we sort of pull this all together, the importance of planning for dealing with volunteers. How do you sort of work through that process with clients of, you know, how far out do you need to plan? What should you be watching for? What decisions have to be made in, in that plan? Yeah, and I think right now we're, we're still in a, in a pretty good spot. Um, we, we have enough options. Um, I, I go back to that statement of the easy button, you know, and often the easy button is what I did last year and the year before. And, and we do need to sort of say, hey, you know, that's not going to work anymore based on these changes or the fact that you want to, to start to do these various mixes that are going to have antagonism. We have alternative strategies, you know, again, the FOPs aren't working, you know, we can switch over to a clethid in a product like Arrow, but, you know, I've never used Arrow before. I'm scared of it. Well, let me help you. Let me walk you through. Let me help you learn how to use it yeah. properly, you know, so that you have that success. So I think right now our, our planning is still pretty good. We can still do a lot of it in the winter. You know, if we've got guys that are going to, uh, you know, aim to grow the, the best genetic traits of corn and, uh, and that might bring in all kinds of, of different herbicide options, um, that's going to take a little bit more, especially if they are corn on corn and then we then we have to start planning and looking a little bit further into the future but I think in the case of, of corn for most of us in, in Ontario we're, we're still okay but uh, we just got to make sure that we have made those plans so that we don't pull into the field you know with the jug thinking oh shoot I'll switch it now well you know Too it just late. doesn't happen right so so we still yeah. need to do those decisions at the kitchen table in the winter time yeah Jason I mean you're dealing with three or four extra crops in rotation as well um and get to deal with some of these things so how complicated does that does that just dis discussion around the table in winter get it gets more complicated obviously because of that i mean we do still have guys that are three crops so let's say wheat canola soybeans um, but when we add in these other crops as well it does complicate things a bit more um not as much as per se if a guy's also got potatoes in rotation then it really throws in a bigger wrench but it just means you have to start planning things out more than a year out. So yeah. what we try to do is then look at things based on the rotation. So if they got a four crop rotation, well, then let's plan four years out. Uh, those type of things to try to run through all those different scenarios. Um, and then obviously, you know, throw in product availability challenges that we've had in the past yeah. too can, yeah. can, can happen again. But but that's what we try to do on a, on a more of a case, you know, instead of just looking at it year by year, trying to look at it over their entire rotation. This antagonism question uh, or, or knowledge of how we're going to manage these things, do you think it's going to be a challenge to convince growers that a herbicide pass is going to have to be two? Drew, I'll maybe start well, with that. Right? Like that they're, seems they're... to be a 
you're going to have to. So then what do you do? Well, and, and, and you don't always have to, but, but because again, yeah. right. So it, it, it comes down to logistics of the farm and that's going to be a farm by farm decision. You know, if you have ample spray capacity, um, breaking up a spray pass does not bother a guy. If you're relying on, on custom and you don't have a lot of, of custom applicators nearby, you know, it's just not going to happen. You're not going to get your spraying done timely. So you're going to have to figure out how to overcome that antagonism. And so far, we have not had, you know, complete hard roadblocks. Yes, the FOP products don't work with 2,4-D, but the DIMs still do. All right, let's make that switch. Let's make sure that we uh, do everything we, we need to do to make sure the DIMs work well and, and, and we're off to the races. But, um, yes, you know what? Splitting up sprays, they work so much better. You know, and this doesn't even have to be in the case of volunteers. When we start mixing broadleaf herbicides with grass herbicides, there's almost always a degree of antagonism. And, and you know, normally we can get around that, you know, playing with surfactants, playing with the rates and whatnot. But if you are trying to get absolute Cracker Jack best weed control, it is best to break it up. But you know what? I'm not the guy that's pulling my wallet out and, and putting someone into that sprayer or paying the, uh, the custom applicator to do it. Jason, do you agree? Oh, well, yeah, 100%. Like uh, I would say that today that uh, growers are much more open to doing multiple passes. And mm -hmm. a big part of it is, yeah, when I began my career in 95, so late 90s into early 2000s, not every f few guys had their own sprayer, their own high clearance sprayer. Mm -hmm. If they had one, it was, uh, you know, a pull type flexi coil or a band sprayer or something like yeah. that, which we finally shifted and put into the bush. Yeah. But now more have their own. So they have the ability to do that. There's still all, always that uh, economy of scale as well. The guys that have, you know, 10,000 mm -hmm. acres and are spread out over, you know, 30 miles might not be as inclined. But yeah, gone are the days where guys in Winkler try to, you know, tank mix Puma with uh, Bazagran to do everything in one shot, right? To get away from that second application. Cocktail. You know, those cocktails, yeah. because, yeah, I think they just have that ability now and they're not afraid and they've seen it on their own farms, too, where things work better that way. And and I mean, they're, and they're, they have a bigger, a better network now of people like Drew or like myself and others that they can tap into to, you know, figure out what works and what doesn't work together. Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. And I think this is the key part as well as when you know, it's one thing if it's like, eh, it works okay. It's another when you're going to lose control of a particular weed or problem by mixing certain things. There's just, that becomes a pretty clear case of having to go over two times. Um, but it is, I mean, you bring up a good point, Jason. It, while more farmers probably have more of their own equipment, potentially, you're also, if you're at scale that you're running 24 seven as it is, yeah. it does become that balancing act, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely. Oh, Peter, that's very sweet. A better network, Lindsay and the agronomists. It's true. I love bringing everyone together, Peter. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right, now uh, we're, we're just about out of time, so I will ask each of you, because you're out there, what is the strangest weed you've seen in the field so far this spring? I'm throwing this way out there, but I happen to know that Jason finds the nastiest ones, or at least your team does. Mm -hmm. So... I know it's yeah. only end of June, but Drew, what's the strangest we've you found so far? Geez, you know what? I, I I don't know if I have anything that would would jump right out and and uh, and be be strange. But uh, the one of the ones that I found that was really sort of odd to me was uh, was bed straw. And oh. and for those of you that aren't familiar with bed straw, bed straw it's is fun. basically a uh, looks exactly like a cleaver. It's the same but family, it, but it, not it just sticky. Has, yeah. It, no, it's it's sticky too. It, uh, yep. it if you walk Round. past it in a pair of flannel pants, it would stick. Yep. Yeah. And and um, it, but it's it's. I can't remember if it's if it's a perennial or, or just a, a biennial or a short lived winter annual. But so you go out to a field and you're like, holy smacks, this there's there's cleavers that are eight inches big in in the middle of yeah. May. Um, how hot was it? And 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 so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was one that that popped up, and and everyone thinks it's cleavers because it looks exactly like yes. it has the whirl of leaves around yep. it. Um, yeah. but, uh, so that's one that sort of threw me for a loop and, and I was proud of myself that I was properly able to identify it. Good job. So I actually, I have bed straw in, in the backyard and the first time I saw it, I was like, this has followed me from Saskatchewan. Like I was <laughs> certain it was cleavers and it followed me here. Yeah. And then I grabbed it and I'm like, it's not 
quite right. Like it's not quite cleavers, but it looks just like it. Um, I can't get rid of it either, Drew, but it's it's not in the field, so it's fine. It's in a yard. Uh, Jason, have you found any terrible invasive weeds this year yet? Or uh, what's the strangest one you've found so far? I guess the strangest, it's not really that exciting. It's not a uncommon weed, but it is a noxious weed called nodding thistle. And no. so you usually see it at pastures, you know, grasslands, pastures. Um, so I, we have found some in a field, within a field. Um, How did it get there? Pretty odd. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. not something Birds. you would typically see. Um, a prostrate knotweed, which is kind of a weed that really likes gravel approaches yeah. and things like that, is becoming a bigger issue within fields. Mm -hmm. And it's a bugger to kill. Yeah. Yes, it is. I've heard yeah. that, yeah, because we have it, Drew. We have it here in Ontario quite a bit. Oh, it, it, and you yeah. know what? This is going to make people roll over and, and want to shoot me, but yeah, uh, it definitely seems to like no-till more than it does conventional till. Oh, uh, Drew, what and, have you done? Yeah, I know, right? And uh, <laughs> like, just watch the comments blow up. But but it's true. Yeah. It, it uh, like you say, it likes the gravel, but it, it just seems to uh, you you can control it quite well with tillage, which is you know, but it it does show up more yeah. in no-till for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, but there are other weeds that are made far worse by tillage because they get chopped up and then all their little pieces start to grow. So you got to know exactly. which weeds you're after. Yeah. Some of them are going to thrive in no-till. Some of them are going to thrive in tillage. Uh, yeah. Peter agrees that prostate knotweed has been a big issue this year. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's not a nice one, Jason. I'm sorry that you're finding it. I'm going to look up this thistle, though, because I don't know if I've ever seen it before. So I'm going to look it up. Um, that's what we do here. We look up weeds. We also look up moths these days we're finding all mm -hmm. sorts of fun moths and so we've oh, been yeah. finding them yeah we've i learned lots of things about moths all right the problem with moths is they started as a caterpillar that was eating something I'm, right <laughs> exactly yes and so yeah. well so the one side i found though it shows like the moth and then what the caterpillar looks like which is helpful because then you can actually start to recognize what they are before they're moths um most of them are not good I'll be honest. <laughs> Many of them are fine, but some of them are not good. Anyway, uh, we are out of time, but this has been absolutely so much fun. Thank you so much. And uh, I do appreciate not just each of you for coming on and all of my guests that come on to the show, but yes, everyone who joins us in the comments makes for so such good dialogue to have questions and comments coming in from across Canada. I really do appreciate it all the way from the West to the East and wherever else uh, people end up. So Jason, thank you so much. And I wanted everyone to know Jason actually spent the afternoon with Kelvin filming a couple of canola schools. So he is having a very real ag Monday. Um, very, very, so I, very I, yeah. yes, very relaxed. So I really appreciate your time. And Drew, this is your first time on the show, but it absolutely will not be your last. Thank you so much for making time for us. Thanks for the opportunity. Yep. All right. You, and uh, just just a quick reminder: there is no show next week. So Monday is a holiday because of Canada Day, following on a Saturday, uh, and then the week after that, Kara Oosterhouse will be in the driver's seat. Uh, so, and then I'll be back the week after that. So there you go. All right. Thank you, everyone. Head on over to realagriculture.com/agronomist to get those CU credits. And uh, thank you to Real Ag Radio, to Adama Canada, and to US Borax for sponsoring tonight's show. Cheers, everybody.